Hello everyone, welcome to another session of Tika Talks Food. Today, in honor of World Diabetes Day, which occurs on the 14th of November, I'm gonna be talking about six tips to manage your blood glucose levels and optimize your diabetes control. This year's theme for World Diabetes Day is basically access to diabetes care. Anytime I do a Tika Talks food video, that is exactly what I intend to do. I intend to provide you with access to information that is exclusive to a clinical practitioner who works with people with various nutrition issues on a daily basis. To help me bring this information to more people, please subscribe to the channel, please share your comments with me and share the information with as many friends and family as you can. So let's get started. What is diabetes? Diabetes is a disease in which the pancreas either has difficulty producing sufficient insulin to manage blood glucose levels, or when your body has trouble using insulin to manage blood glucose levels. So essentially, according to the World Health Organization, diabetes is the leading cause for blindness, kidney disease, heart attack, stroke, and lower limb amputation. So a lot of you had asked me to do videos on um, heart disease management and dietary considerations for all of those things. But the reality is that diabetes and blood glucose control tend to be the gateway to all other diseases. So if we manage one, we tend to be pretty good at managing everything else. So let's get started with the first tip. The first tip is identifying carbohydrates. Forget good carbs, bad carbs, forget what's, you know, whole grains versus refined carbohydrates. Let's start with being objective and looking at every single carbohydrate source from your diet. It can come from vegetables, it can come from fruits, it can come from grains, it can come from legumes and pulses. Sometimes it can even come from nuts and seeds, okay? So the first step is to identify all the sources of carbohydrates in your diet, and this will be quite illuminating for a lot of you, and you can start with reducing. You can start with trying to keep it, you know, in, in a plate at about 25% of that plate from obvious carbohydrate sources, okay? The next step is tricking your brain, okay? So tip number two is literally trick your brain. How do you trick your brain, you may ask? The first thing, it starts with the plate that you use to eat. The same amount of food in a big plate versus a small plate can have a very different impact on your brain. It can give you a very different signal of like what satisfaction looks like. So start with looking at your plates and saying, hmm, do I really need such a big plate? And is that the reason why I am emotionally not feeling satisfied with my meal, okay? Another way to trick your brain is making sure you're chewing your food and not drinking it. Oh, Okay, anybody who knows me or who has watched me practice know that this is my favorite phrase. Chew your food, don't drink it. The reality is the slower that you chew your food, the longer you give your brain to identify that you're eating. Okay, you're also facilitating your digestive process, which actually starts at your mouth. So if you're drinking your food, if you're th drinking things like juice or smoothies or shakes, it doesn't matter how healthy the label looks. The reality is that you are going to be stifling your brain from realizing that it's eating and by the time it realizes that you're eating you're gonna have eaten too much food or had a lot of calories by then okay so remember it is very important for you to be chewing your food the third thing watch out for hidden carbohydrates so Tip number three, this is basically gonna be a quick rundown on how I look at nutrition labels. So here, I'm gonna look at two different breakfast cereals. So it's a common breakfast choice for a lot of people, breakfast cereals. So first thing I do anytime I compare two products is let's look at label number one and label number two. Always look at serving size. So if you see both of these cereals, they both say that the recommended serving size is half a cup. So a half a cup of each of these cereal is what we're gonna compare like for like. Second thing I look at is not sugar, but total carbohydrate content. So if you see the cereal on the right basically has 29 grams of total carbohydrates, where the cereal on the left only has 14 grams of total carbohydrates. Why am I saying this? It is because as I told you in my jaggery video, if any of you had watched it, all carbohydrates except fiber 
they're basically gonna break down into glucose and cause your blood glucose to go up. So essentially, there is no point in only looking at total sugars, you need to look at total carbohydrates, okay? So the next thing you look at is basically fiber content. So if you see the, the one on the right, it basically has four grams of fiber, which is not bad because remember the quality of a carbohydrate is determined by its fiber content. So more fiber equals better. So this one has four grams of fiber, but look at the other one, right? It's got 14 grams of total carbs, but it's got nine grams of fiber. So what it tells me is out of the 14 grams of carbs, nine grams of it, which is majority of it is coming from fiber. So again, very good choice, okay? Number three, I tend to look at added sugar content. So, you know, pretty much every governing body and every provider will, will agree that added sugar is not something that is good for anybody, let alone someone who has diabetes. So if, again, if you look at the one on the right, it's got two grams of added sugar, and the one on the left, it's got zero grams of added sugar. Sometimes you'll see a lot of cereals that will say zero added sugar, Remember, zero added sugar doesn't mean zero carbohydrates, and we break down all carbohydrates into sugar, okay? Which is why it's always important to start with looking at the total and then remembering that fiber, starch, sugar, these are all subcategories of total carbohydrates, okay? The next thing I look at in a nutrition label is the protein content, okay? So when you're looking at protein, protein can also slow down the release of glucose in your blood. So if a product has more protein, it can also be helpful in controlling your blood glucose spike. So if you see the one on the right, it basically has about five grams of protein, which is not bad for a grain, but the one on the left has 11 grams of protein. So again, that's really helpful. So remember, tip number three is make sure you're looking for hidden carbohydrates. Don't just look at the front of the label and say, ooh, this is zero added sugar, this is a great choice. Make sure you're looking at the back of the label, looking at what's the reasonable serving size and what's the total carbohydrates, what is the fiber in relation to the total carbohydrates, okay? Now, tip number four, exercise. Now this really stresses a lot of people out, right? They're like, I know, I know I need to exercise, but I'm so busy and I don't get enough time. The reality is that exercise doesn't necessarily have to mean that you have to wear gym clothing or that you have to work with a personal trainer, okay? According to the CDC, you wanna be engaging in about 20 to 30 minutes of moderate intensity exercise. What does moderate intensity exercise mean? So it means you're reaching about 60 to 70% of your maximum heart rate and keeping it there. So for example, if I'm talking about a 40 year old person, their maximum heart rate is gonna be 220 minus their age, so that's about 180. And then you're gonna look at 60 to 70% of 180, and that is basically the heart rate that they want to stay in in order to be considered moderate intensity exercise. So it's actually not that hard to get to that, okay? And if you're not able to do that, you wanna make sure that you're at least engaging in 15 minutes of post-food exercise, post-perennial exercise. So studies are basically saying that people who walk 15 minutes after breakfast, 15 minutes after lunch, 15 minutes after dinner, they're basically getting as much or even better outcomes when it comes to blood glucose levels and lowering insulin levels as people who are walking 45 minutes a day all in one stretch, okay? So I can definitely understand being busy and being unable to allocate 45 minutes or an hour or just exclusive time to exercise, but most of us can actually fit in 15 minutes after each meal to help us reduce that blood glucose spike, okay? So just get started maybe from tomorrow, you know, tell yourself, I'm at least gonna get started with my post-dinner walks. And remember, it is easy to get started once you get started and you get into the momentum, it's gonna be much easier to sustain, okay? So tip number four, exercise slash movement. Don't overcomplicate it, start with something simple, okay? Number five, this is something that, you know, we can keep drumming down, but people tend to forget. 
hydration, okay? It is very important to stay hydrated because number one, dehydration is going to concentrate your blood with blood glucose, right? It's simple chemistry. If you don't have enough water, you're going to concentrate the glucose and that's not going to make you feel good, especially if you're someone who's very sensitive to high glucose levels, okay? And the second reason and the more important reason to stay hydrated is because a lot of times our body cannot differentiate between thirst and hunger. So for someone who naturally doesn't gravitate towards drinking enough fluids, you may think when you're thirsty that you're hungry and you may go look for some snacky type food and you may not reach out for the right choice when you're making decisions at that point, okay? So it's very important for you to maintain good hydration levels so that when you're hungry, you know that you're actually hungry and there's no chance that it's actually thirst. And it doesn't always have to come from water, okay? Herbal non-caffeinated teas can be pretty good hydrating options um, to get your fluid needs in. So. I love peppermint tea. I can keep going on about it. Um, other options are things like jasmine tea, chamomile tea, lemon tea, ginger tea, right? Any of these herbal teas, you can basically make them and you can have them, you know, throughout the day, like one or two cups so that it changes it up and it gives you an extra flavor with water unsweetened versions of it, okay? That's the key, no adding sugar to it. The second thing is also seltzer water. So carbonated waters that do not have any sugar added to them, but are like lemon flavored or like orange flavored or berry flavored. Basically, this can also offer you, you a more interesting way to up your fluid intake. Now, a lot of people ask me, what's the right amount of water I need to drink in a day? Like, what's the goal? Is it eight glasses? Is it one gallon? What is it? Well, the reality is that your fluid intake depends on your age. It depends on your activity level. It depends on the weather, you know, and all of those things. A simple way to gauge your fluid needs is to look at your body, if you're someone who measures in kilograms, take 30 to 35 ml multiplied by your body weight in kilograms, and that should be around the ballpark of where you want to be in terms of fluid intake. So someone who's 80 kilograms, if I take 80 times 30, that's about 2,400 or 2.4 liters, liters a day. Um, for those of you who are familiar with ounces and pounds, you want to aim for about half of your body weight in ounces from water or non-caffeinated unsweetened beverages. So if you're like 160 pounds, that's about 80 ounces of fluids. Again, this is for individuals whose doctor has not put them on any sort of fluid restriction because of a condition they have or because of medications that they're taking. Okay, so stay hydrated because that's going to prevent you from reaching out for more food than you need to. Now, the last tip, number six, is make sure you know your blood glucose levels. So I know a lot of you may be familiar with finger sticks, and this is where I want to tell you, I do not get paid by any of these companies to say this, but sometimes it's useful to do continuous glucose monitoring for a period of two to four weeks to know kind of what your glucose journey is, okay? So Abbott's Libre or Dexcom um, glucose monitoring system, these are some common ones. They're useful to see like, what do different types of foods or different types of actions have on your blood glucose level? So here's me, I was wearing a glucose sensor for a period of two weeks, just because I wanted to learn, you know, not because I'm managing my diabetes, at least not at this moment. So. This was me when I just had a cup of coffee with one spoon of sugar, okay? So, you know, again, the coffee had milk and it was one spoon of sugar. I do not have diabetes. This is the glucose response. This is me when I actually spent an entire day fasting. So a lot of people think that, you know, if you're fasting that you're, it's gonna cause your glucose levels to go down. Now, if you're healthy and you're not on too many medications, your body actually has the ability to maintain glucose levels even when you are not eating, okay? So essentially, this gives you a way to objectively know what your personal glucose responses are to different foods. You don't have to listen to me or your doctor who's telling you like, oh, you know, berries are better than banana or 
oatmeal is better than rice. It might not be, right? Depending on who you are and depending on your gut microbiome. I work with clients from different parts of the world who are exposed to different types of foods and their bodies respond very differently to different carbohydrates and different combinations of food, okay? So this is one of my client, and of course, he's a wonderful, funny client, and basically, he sent me this glucose reading, and he said, Tika, can you guess what I had, okay? So this is a task for you guys. Put it in the comment section, tell me what you think this client had that caused this giant glucose response that he was trying to be tricky and funny with me and say, hey, you know what? My blood glucose came back to a normal level. The reality is that that's not good enough. That peak is quite dangerous. So tell me in the comment section what you think that client had, okay? So these are generally my six tips for maintaining blood glucose levels, okay? So let me review again. Number one, making sure you're identifying carbohydrates and working on reducing the quantities, okay? Number two, making sure you know how to trick your brain, okay? Using smaller utensils, trying to make sure that you are chewing your food, right? That's a good way to trick your brain. Number three, making sure you know how to read nutrition labels, that you're looking for the right things and you're not falling for the traps on the front of the package. Number four, focusing on movement. Even if you're not able to go to the gym and exercise, trying to do the best. Do more today than you did yesterday and that's progress. Number five, staying hydrated, okay? Always focusing on your total fluid intake because that's gonna help you identify when you're truly hungry, okay? And number six, consider using technology to your advantage, okay? Uh, consider using a continuous glucose monitoring system for a period of two to four weeks to identify what your personal responses are to different combinations of foods or different types of carbohydrates, okay? please subscribe to the channel, give me comments, guess what food my patient had. I will tell you at the start of next video who got the right answer and what the true answer is. And you know, catch me in other videos where I will talk about things like intermittent fasting or um, low carb diets, etc. Also keep throwing those suggestions of what else you wanna hear about. Happy World Diabetes Day, work on your blood glucose control, and let's all together try our best to provide diabetes care and good health care information to everybody that we can. Take care and have a wonderful week ahead. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.